squat, scorn. This video is sponsored by Squarespace, the Antoine Dupont of website builders. Scorn. We are now six years into the era of Eddie Jones, England boss, and 21 years into his international coaching career, and yet if you asked me to sum up everything we've learned about Randwick's own Tasmanian devil in that time, it would take me just three words. He's always himself. A genius tactician hiding behind the cantankerous charm of your school's most divisive chemistry teacher, Jones has been coaching international rugby longer than anyone else in the game, and his CV contains more shock results than Henry Say's lateral flow collection. And yet, as his England team polished off a decidedly average Six Nations, Jones finds himself in a decidedly familiar vat of hot water, as some of Rugby Union's most headline-worthy pundits, writers, and non-entities call for Eddie Jones' resignation just 18 months out from a World Cup. Not that they'd have anyone in line to replace him now that Argentina become the first team to break glass and deploy Checker. However, this last month, as I start to reflect on the Six Nations and look back over everything we saw, and perhaps more importantly, everything we didn't, I've had a creeping feeling crawling across my entire being, a sickness I couldn't deny, something that made my skin really, really itch. But being a Wales fan is nothing new, so I should probably talk about the other thing that made me feel ill to admit. Because from where we're sitting right now, admittedly, with a hell of a lot had changed in the 18 months between now and the final whistle blowing in St. Denis in October 28th, I think England are going to win the 2023 Rugby World Cup. Call it a hunch, an instinct, or an informed finding based on hours of studying the Six Nations, several World Cups, and a lifetime of veggie and antics. But I can't shake the visions. George Furbank is set to retire with a World Cup winner's medal. So, I think all of this begs a few questions. After England was so 6 out of 10 in the Six Nations, just what evidence, why have I got this feeling, and how did it seep into my bones? I've already described Eddie Jones the man, but I'd label Eddie Jones the international rugby coach in exactly the same way. He's always himself. The Eddie Jones way is rarely conventional, and whilst occasionally that's been to his detriment by his own admission, his alternate tactics, the last World Cup final backfired on him, generally, the Eddie Jones way has been the way everyone else will be playing once they work out why he was doing it, which will always be the invitation he needs to rip everything up and start the process of revolution again a few years later. Jones's career as a head coach began in 1998, when then Brumby's coach and rare man who could convincingly cosplay as Donkey Kong, Rod McQueen, was pulled away to take over the Australian national team, leaving his assistant Eddie, who retired from playing just three years earlier, in charge of the second best club in the Southern Hemisphere. And whilst by his own admission Jones was out of his depth in that first season, over the next few years Jones built the Brumbies into a dominant force. Not only did he lead them to the most successful period in their history, becoming the first team from outside New Zealand to ever win Super Rugby, from a a purely playing perspective, Eddie Jones's Brumbies team became arguably the most innovative, influential and important club side in the history of rugby union. A lot of the ideas Jones introduced to Super Rugby in 1999 remain the backbone of international teams' attacks today. In the mid-90s, rucks looked like this. At the 95 World Cup, the average team would go through 38 rucks a game, with only around half of a team's carries resulting in a breakdown. And for good reason. Rucks were a free-for-all. Scrum halves forced to wait 10 seconds to see which team's forwards got the most punches on the floor before they had the chance to just lob it away, just get it out of there. Whilst we were just about beyond the days of every forward being expected to reach every breakdown, I looked over every ruck from Australia's games against Tier 1 teams from the World Cup in 95, and I didn't find a single phase where fewer than four forwards committed to a ruck, and generally it was more than that, nor a single one where a single back entered, which, as you can imagine, slow things down, even though as someone who played in the backs. Sounds pretty ideal. The average ruck speed in that tournament was about 9.4 seconds. Enter Eddie. This is from the Super Rugby semi-final in Eddie's second season in charge. After running a lovely move, dummy runner Pat Howard is looking up and locking onto an imposing jackal threat as an assigned part of his role in the pre-planned play. A few years prior, Australia didn't throw a single back into a breakdown all World Cup. Then, Jones bakes the outside centre clearing out into the fabric of a strike play, allowing Gregan to play the ball away after just four seconds, less than half the average from just one year earlier, and close to the average today. Eddie Jones' Brumbies basically invented fast ball. And whereas some coaches might see innovation as the end result, for Eddie Jones, it's only ever presented further opportunity. In 1995, the average attack lasted just 1.7 phases. Teams did not keep hold of the ball for very long. In 1998, Eddie Jones pioneered the free 
phase move. These were designed to draw defenders up and away over the first two phases so they could run the real strike play the third time around and they were hugely effective. In order to make sure they secured the ball on each of those phases, Jones gave his forwards set positions amongst the backs, so they always had a unit or two on hand to aid the likes of Howard clearing out. Before this, forwards were a lot like Tom Cruise, in that they did nothing but, but run between big set pieces and uh, breakdowns. Jones's reliance on them in the field, amongst the backs, demanded the increase in skill set we've seen today if they were to play an active role in those strike plays. These moves very often targeted the fringes, really attacking this area around the ruck on the pre-thought out second or third phase. This became so influential, teams were forced to invent the guard and pillar in reply, two terms ubiquitous to anyone who's played rugby at any level since. In short, his Brumbies team were a sensation, and it wasn't long before Jones was asked to bring these innovations to the top table, as he was asked to replace his old boss at the top of the scaffolding, promoted to coach the Australian national team, and after back-to-back letters loads and the Tri-Nations title, in 2003 Eddie Jones was catapulted into what would soon be his lifelong obsession, the Rugby World Cup. Australia entered that World Cup as, ironically considering it was the job he just moved on from, Dark Horses, and they finished as runners-up. Jones has talked a number of times about how it took several years for him to work out what went wrong and move past it, but thankfully he was able to come to terms with it, thanks to Squarespace. Using its plethora of web features, Jones was able to easily journal his account of what happened in that World Cup. He could create pages dedicated to the Wallabies battering Romania and Namibia in the pool stages. He could easily insert videos of them cruising past Argentina or squeezing by Ireland. He could integrate social media functions simply to bring everyone up to date on how they could comfortably defeat Scotland in the quarterfinals just as Australia did. And all of it could point people towards a shop entirely dedicated to the big one. For years in advance, Eddie Jones prepped ways to beat the number one team in the world, the All Blacks, in the semi-final. Also, that on that website he could sell t-shirts easily, bearing the infamous words, Four more years, boys. And then he used the blogging features to create updates on the infamous finalist's incredibly famous extra time play by play. And just the Wallabies were 10% off from winning that World Cup. You too can save 10% by clicking the link in the description and using the offer code SQUIDRUGBY. It's what Eddie Jones would uh, want. This lit a fire in Eddie, and not just for web design, which I'm sure he's continued since. Seeing his team come so close to fall so late was almost as agonising as knowing he was bettered by Clive Woodward. And this is what... I'm sorry, what was his name again? John... Jombs. Ste- Stephen jo- Stephen Jom. This is what Stephen Joms forgets. Eddie Jones will always be himself. And ever since that fateful final, Eddie Jones has cared about nothing, absolutely nothing in the world other than winning the Rugby World Cup. And I think all of this was evident in the 2022 Six Nations. Perhaps the biggest criticism of England this year is how shapeless and floppy they've looked with the ball, which is especially jarring after how well they broke down teams in the autumn. So, the big question is, why? Under new attack coach Martin Gleeson, England have adopted an extremely experimental system that frequently looks like they have no system at all. Now, as I previously alluded to, almost every team in modern international rugby plays some variation on the 1-3-3-1, one, three, three, one, a tactic that just describes where across the field you place your eight forwards. It's a set structure, a formation that informs the kind of width, pace and style your team can play with. The 1-3-2-2 deployed by Japan, Wales and Australia is designed to get the most out of a lighter pack. The 2-4-2 common in Super Rugby emphasises the forwards handling, not carrying, whilst the Springboks play a kind of more 2-2-2-2 two, 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 because they're enormous forwards need less support and subtlety to go forward. It's a tactical choice made to best fit your pack and how you want to play. This Six Nations, England tore this idea up. Instead, they looked to play what Jones described as positionless, formationless rugby. Whilst teams shifting between formations when they enter a new zone of the field is pretty common now, Italy go from a 1-3-3-1 to 1-2-2 here as they cross the halfway line, England went one step further and changed it up on a play-by-play basis. We can see a great example of it here. England pressure causes Italy's teenage nine Varney to panic and throw an interception, and England instantly set into a 1-3-3-1. Smith hits Dombrant, and the positionless idea then really comes into effect. England set their forward shape on the blind side. Except all seven forwards here are backs. Normally, a team would set with forwards in front and backs behind in what's known as the boot, and either the forwards would carry or they'd pass behind the backs to unleash their wild steppy bullshit. But when it's all backs, Brex has no idea what he's faced with and makes a panic read, allowing England to flood right through. Harry Randall's been running a cheat line, but goes instead in to secure the ball. Knowing speed is vital, it's more important than him playing his role, as Marcus Smith floods on to organise the inverse of what we just saw. Seven of the eight forwards on this side over here, it's entirely forwards, and England adopt a 1-2-2-2-1 formation. Yules and Stewart 
it on Smith's inside to hold the Italian defence, and the running threat of Smith himself forces Lamro to disconnect momentarily. Now, if England had stuck to the more standard 1-3-3-1 they were running just 8 seconds earlier, Alex Dombrand here is committed to this group and just runs a hard line, which would allow Padovani to then drift and cover the two wide men. Instead, being in a 2 allows Dombrand to run this overs line, meaning he's on the outside and Padovani can't cover George until the pass is thrown. This allows edge forward George to power down the wing and ride you on his tackle to finish in the corner. England changed formation three times in 10 seconds, with Marcus Smith of fly half in charge of calling the structure he thinks will unlock the defence best in each scenario, on each play. This is something he got better at as the tournament went on. Against Scotland, Smith actively blunted England's attack by looking to play the more steppy, individually attacking game he does for Quinns, but by the time England faced Wales in round three, he was incredibly adept. He'd got used to this, managing a set of phases here incredibly well to keep England's forwards marching forward. However, the moment Smith is off his feet, the moment he gets tackled, he's out of the game. England's shape just fell apart. The point of a 1-3-3-1 type structure is to prevent this ever happening, to make sure you have attacking options across the full width of the pitch at all times. But because England's shape is so much braver, whenever Marcus Smith wasn't there to boss things for Six Nations, England's shape, their whole attack, fell apart. It became pointlessly blunt to the extent they just had to admit defeat and kick the ball away instead of being marched backwards by a defence. However, this pain will be greatly eased once England bring back their secret weapon. The winner of Wigan's most belittled child, 1998, Owen Farrell. Farrell and Smith thus far have only played one game together, the comprehensive demolition of Australia last November, but it gave us a perfect idea of how the pair can act as a foil for each other. The Six Nations structure debacle was doubly frustrating, because challenging defenders and making grown men look like they were built out of kippers is a large part of why Marcus Smith is such an exciting young talent, one of the most exciting in the world. Yet, in order to make the attack function, he found himself hamstrung by the kind of boring shape and structure management shit that people normally just ignore George Ford excelling at, giving us the best of neither world. Australia? offered us a solution before the problem even arose. Off the scrum, Farrell just looks to engage the defence and then play the ball to Marcus Smith, a far more instinctive player. Smith jinks on the outside, but the Australian defence recovers and gets him to ground. Now, in the Six Nations, this would have spelled trouble, shapelessness, attack over, and an incoming think piece from Clive Woodward on why he needs to recall Danny Cipriani, but instead, Owen Farrell takes control and calls the shape. England set to a 1 3 one and he orders two Lange into the wide channel. As Laws tips inside to Underhill, Farrell reorganises the shape, shifting it into a fascinating 1 3 2 one, one. Realising Australia's defence is heaviest in midfield, Farrell takes it out by inviting a toji onto the carry, he's part of the pod so the ball is fast as possible, then calls quick ball to himself. Defence congested here, Farrell knows this dummy run by Rod should be enough to draw his Waluigi, Rodder, at which point the more instinctive play of Smith is what's needed. Tulangi's in the wide channel as requested, alongside Malins, George, and hitting the line late, Stewart. Smith jinks and buys him a second whilst forcing O'Connor to step in. He hits Stewart, who flies through and steps and just brilliantly to score. But if O'Connor makes a different decision, England have freed up Smith to select any of these options here based on what the Australian defence does. The Smith Farrell combo could be utterly lethal. Ignore what people say, Owen Farrell is one of the most intelligent, level headed players to ever play rugby, and his management of an attack is next level, but perhaps most importantly, also selfless. Smith and Stewart got the credit for this try, but Farrell masterminded the softening of the Australian defence that allowed Smith to do his thing. A phrase I expect I'll be saying again this summer. And here, in the last game against France, England are aware France like to flood through and pressure the nine, as they do the aforementioned Varney here. But whilst you can say many things about Ben Youngs, and I have in the past, I believe, a petite teenager without much experience, he is not. And he just calmly jinks and gets the ball to his ten. And whilst the timing now has changed, Simmons still nails his dummy run and it forces him back to check his charge, meaning the rest of the defence need to follow suit and remain aligned somehow, except Dante and Villiers react slightly differently to this change in timing. And Marchand picks a beautiful line between them, Smith wanting the ball right away. But Youngs doesn't hear him, then Laws ignores him like he's a single mother, but it shifts the point of focus really nicely, Slade running a lovely line to give Daly an extra second. He times the ball to Stewart superbly, who then finishes phenomenally well once again. He's really good at this. It's such an efficient attacking set by England, and shows what they can do when more of the pieces start to slot together. In a usual system, this final exchange wouldn't have worked. Laws and George would not have been set this far apart to give them the time to change focus repeatedly like this, and I don't think the first half of the Six Nations either, they would have scored this. It took a full campaign of getting better to be at this point. But also it doesn't stop with the fly halves. With Smith and Slade here tied into the ruck, Jack Nowell takes over and calls for successive phases on the blind side. If this strategy is going to take off long term, England are going to need all their backs to be able to step in and boss things, rather than just Smith, Ford and Farrell. It's also entirely possible that the game plan England are pushing at the minute is going to be their plan B come next year. In the autumn, they ran significantly more strike plays, moves designed to catch teams out on the first three phases, as Eddie Jones so coveted in his days in Canberra. They're probably already practising moves at the minute that we won't see until the quarterfinals, because Eddie cares about nothing else. He cares about nothing but winning the world. 
World Cup. It's the why he gets up in the morning. It's the only thing he lives for. But even when he isn't trying to win the World Cup, he's still all about shaking it up. After a few years as a consultant at Saracen Centauri in South Africa, Eddie Jones lined up his second shot at the Rugby World Cup in 2012, when he replaced John Kerwin at the helm of a Japanese side who hadn't won a World Cup match since 1991. Now, I've done a full hour in the past on just how Jones prepared the Brian Miracle, and went on to lead Japan to maybe the most famous moment in Test Rugby's history, but this bears some fascinating comparisons to his time in England. 18 months into his regime, Japan played like a parody of their eventual World Cup selves. Only thinking long term, Jones was so desperate to break old habits that he told players they could only kick if they were behind their own goal line, trying to coax out a new style of rugby from them. This is just the most dramatic example of what amount of three years of sacrificial lambs. Jones didn't care if they lost every single game along the way, if it helped prepare his team for the seven games that really mattered. And something I think, I'm sorry I forgot his name again. What was it? Jongles. Still but, this is something that Still but Jongles has forgotten was true of the England team as well. The 2018 tournament might be largely forgotten now, but at the time, that was an even greater disgrace than what Jones had produced this year. Much like Martin Gleeson now, in 2018, England had just appointed a new attack coach in Scott Wisemantle, and that Six Nations acted as a prototype that allowed them to perfect what they would accomplish 18 months later, even though it eventually led to them finishing fifth in the Six Nations, their worst ever performance. So, in order to showcase just what can change in those 18 months, let's contrast this clip from the 2018 Six Nations and the infamous, incredible Manu Tuolangi try from the semi-final against the All Blacks. In both cases, England work a little overlap, have defensive scrambling, and the right winger steps inside to stay in the field of play, leading England setting up a ruck almost on exactly the same point of the field. And from there, the setup is extremely similar, a 1-3-2-2 shape with George Ford stood here and Mauro Rotoje stood here. But if we check what happens next, 2019's example leads to another break and ultimately, a try. 2018's example leads to a turnover and a Scottish penalty. So, what changed? The big change is actually something very small. In 2018, three England players enter this breakdown. In 2019, it's something Johnny May does alone, like sorting out North Korea. And so this gives England an additional two bodies in the attack. One slots in here, meaning this carry is a genuine threat that holds the Kiwi defenders in a way the Scottish tacklers here are not fussed at all by one winger on his own. England then slot a second distributor into the boot, granting an extra option and the forwards reset so they can take passes from several players, not just Ford, leaning into the fact Farrell here finds himself forced to go alone next phase, ultimately isolated and turned over. Instead, England just spread it wide and keeps shifting the point of focus, recycling with pace. So this leads to another question. How did England free up these two bodies? Robshaw and Watson entering in 2018 was a necessity thanks to the presence of Scotland's biggest jackal threat, John Barclay. But the reason New Zealand's equivalent, Ali Surveyor, is not there is because England already took care of him. Our first phase, Tuolangi charged into the two centres, taking out both of New Zealand's key organisers. The next phase, England deliberately targets Surveyor, Itoje and Vanapola pinning him on the floor, meaning he won't be about to challenge when the break is made moments later. As Watson then enters contact, no England player except May is even contemplating entering the ruck, or setting into shape. This is so well rehearsed, they all know their individual role infinitely better than they did in 2018. That's what time can buy you. Watch the way Etoje and Vanapola shoot immediately up after pinning Surveyor on the ground. But equally, how knowing quick ball will be essential, Sam Underhill then spends the rest of the play man-marking Surveyor. England sacrificing an attacker to prevent the only jackal threat in black getting anywhere near the ball. England had to run passages such as this in 2018 to work out what was wrong and click the final pieces into place with ingenious but tiny strategies. Because it's a truth across his entire coaching career. An Eddie Jones side is only ever one ruck and a little bit of time away from turning their worst season in memory into a place in the World Cup final. The attack this Six Nations, just gone, was heavily flawed, but I think it's only requiring small tweaks that Jones has previously shown he's able to apply in 2019. However, I also think that try against the All Blacks is relevant for another reason. Because in all of these World Cups, Eddie Jones targeted one game in particular. One game that he felt unlocked their path to glory. In 2003, it was the All Blacks. New Zealand were the best team in the world going into the tournament, and Jones levelled up the tactics that he brought to the Brumbies in order to dismantle the favourites. In 2015, it was the Springboks. Jones named his fitness camps Beat the Box. He labelled the tackle bags with South African players. And he had his side doing analysis on the Springboks and their individuals over two years before the game. And then in 2019, with headlines like this commonplace, Eddie Jones plotted perhaps the most comprehensive depowering all black rugby has seen in its history. The current bookies' favourites to win Rugby World Cup 2023 are France.
And it was only whilst watching back England's loss to France a month ago that the feeling, the theory, the creeping, crawling, horrible sensation began to take a hold of me. Because I think, in the same style as the All Blacks and Springboks before them, Eddie Jones is currently plotting, planning, and scheming a means to knock France out of their own home tournament. If the favoured team won every game over the first few stages of the competition, England would face Les Bleus in the semi-final, just like both of Eddie Jones' previous encounters with the All Blacks. During the 2021 Six Nations, Eddie Jones was quite upfront in the fact he was hiding his attack back. England wouldn't be playing as he intended in the World Cup until after the summer's Britain's Irish Lions tour. This was a quote. And so England played quite a straightforward game, except against France. Against France, England deployed this new game plan that they played in 2022 ahead of time. This is England's first attack of the game, and after Watson carries to just let them find shape, they instinctively begin to set a 1 3 2 2. But George Ford then makes the call, and Tom Curry wraps around to fill on his inside, forming some new shape where the distinction between forwards and backs is gone. Johnny May here is essentially the edge forward, and after a great carry by Curry, England's traditional shape essentially disintegrates, becoming a succession of runners instead of a shape, because that's what worked best before snapping back into a 2 4 2 at forward's behest. This carry just takes out three French defenders. This clip by Yules meaning Willemser can't fold as he'd hope and Ford waits for Dupont to bite before giving the pass. Dupont adjusts but Farrell draws him and frees May. England then snap into a 1-3-3-1 and this combined with pick and goes then carries them up the line only to be held up over it. They then run exactly the same tactic a few minutes later and it leads to a try for Anthony Watson. Ford calling, masterminding the shape and eventually delivering the perfect final pass. That first half at Twickenham is frankly the best the cleanest anyone has broken down the French defence in almost three years under Sean Edwards. This clearly told Eddie Jones everything he needed to know. Second half, England then instead played a heavy kicking game for half an hour before snapping back into that effective attack for the last 10 minutes when they needed a winner four points down. They then parked it for a full year and they also parked George Ford. Knowing he could operate an attacking system to dismantle Edwards' defence in his sleep, Jones turned to developing Marcus Smith. Smith had never marshaled an attack like this before this year's Six Nations, but now he's not only experienced, he's extremely capable having improved game on game. And so, as he began developing, Jones was presented with a dress rehearsal for that hypothetical semi-final. He would play the same team at the same stadium with them under enormous pressure, giving him a chance to test out another part of his hypothetical game plan. Now, as I discussed a few times the Six Nations, the friends have developed a pretty lethal kicking game that opens up opportunities for them to counterattack by kicking long and encouraging the opposition to kick back, slowly pushing them backwards. The idea is to find grass each time to turn the fullback and force hurried kicks with lesser and lesser distance. France have been running this tactic for a while now, but the Grand Slam decider gave us the absolute cleanest, clearest, and most efficient example we've seen of this the entire era. The only catch is, it was executed by England. So, England scrum deep in their own half and Smith runs his arcing line outside Slade. Trying to keep nine him, but instead Slade just pumps the ball deep towards the touchline. And England's chase focuses almost entirely on Jaminet, so he has to rush the reply. Smith, however, can regather no problem, and has all the time in the world to work out his response. He hits it down the middle, but knowing Jaminet is hurrying back to the centre, he lands it just outside him, meaning he'll miss the bounce. It's beautifully weighted by Smith and leaves Jaminet under enormous pressure to get rid of it. He only makes it up about 40 metres, and it's really easy for Jack now to eat up 20 of those with the forwards out of shape, the defence, the chase, not really following up. It normally takes France about four or five exchanges to make this kind of return. England do it in two. Against France, England deployed a different kicking game to the rest of the tournament, and it almost completely neutered France's go-to tactic. Dupont attempts to start back and forth here, but Daly feeds Smith, and the greatest talent the Philippines never had, creates the kind of magic that explains Eddie Jones' desperation to ready him. George Ford might still be the best talent in England, as far as I'm concerned, mm -hmm, come at me, but he could never do what Smith does here. The time he gives himself on the ball with these little steps exposes the French chase as essentially a sham, encouraging to kick. Not a real follow-up, not real defence, and Furbank can burst up past the mark where Dupont kicked it. And indeed, Smith also ends the most successful attempt France had at their key tactic all game. After six phases of going nowhere, you know, because of the attacking problems I've mentioned previously, Smith stabs it through for the corner, and Untermat glides in to recover in frankly quite a beautiful way. I'm, like, I'm not going to lie to you guys, this is, this is gorgeous. What can I say, I'm attracted to things that look like my wife. Undermax spirals it downfield beautifully, and Daly just about covers. But he's going backwards, so has to turn before applying without really getting time to aim. And then he's easy for Dupont to take, and then return a great kick finding grass. Furbank here just admits defeat and looks for touch. If France just accept this, it's a 30 metre net gain on where they first kicked. But, wanting more, 
Untermak plays quickly. Jaminet hits it long, but the extra second going for touch the moment they're on the back foot and the duel buys them means England now have the entire field really well covered in a way they didn't earlier. There's someone to take any kick with any hang time. And crucially, England have shifted Marcus Smith into the middle. Now, if we rewind, even though he's never directly involved, we can see Joe Marchant shout instructions and communicate whilst patrolling this touchline. He's just making sure Smith is aware of him, aware of what's going on, and knows he's an option for when it's time to pull the trigger. Dupont flies up alone as Smith figures it's time. He beats him and passes to Marchant. And now England have the ball only 15 metres from where France might have had the line out if not for Untermack gambling like Gautier nicked one more of Warren Gatlin's compadres. Whilst England deployed a back free focus on kick tennis, at fly half they have a secret weapon allowing them to launch counterattacks that nulled the French kicking game. But it wasn't always the side steps. We see France here attempting to launch a duel out their own 22. The chase is great, and if Smith runs his back, there's a solid chance he's probably getting tackled, isolated, and turned over. But instead of kicking as France would want, returning it, he just puts it incredibly high. This allows Stewart, exceptional to the high ball, to get under and win the egg. It might seem odd to focus so much on England's kicking game in a match France won by 11 points, but I've never seen the French tactics dismantled like that before. And it starved France of opportunities. Prior to this game, France had scored 14 tries in 2022, eight of them coming as a direct result of this kicking game, of these tactics. The pressure they put on an opposition resulting in either of them trying to run it and making errors, or presenting opportunities to counterattack. France did score three tries against England, but all three of them originated from set pieces deep in English territory. Two from lineouts for penalty offences by England, and then one scrum because a referee got in the way of play. I make this only the third time in Gautier's 26 games in charge that the French kicking game has failed to produce a single try. England were three small beats, a refereeing anomaly that happens once every 200 games, a Will Stewart brain fart which he probably won't do again, and then them making a better clearer on Gregory Ardrit, away from denying France a single attacking opportunity. England changed those three moments, and these kicking tactics just won them the game against the Grand Slam champions 13-6. France are incredibly clinical, that's why they're as dangerous a side in the tournament favourites that they are at the minute, but England might have shown us the roadmap to denying them a source. Super Saturday was the big one for France, but merely a trial hit out for Eddie Jones. He tightens up their discipline and tweaks their attack, and he has the beating of the host nation on his hands. This would leave England likely up against the winds of a massive semi-final tussle between the All Blacks and Springboks. I don't think Jones is daft enough to underestimate the South African side again, and frankly, even though rugby history is suggesting me this is foolhardy, this is a really stupid thing to say, I just outright haven't seen anything to suggest that this All Blacks team will be as good as Eddie Jones' England could be once they're at full strength. There's a lot yet to change, but if I had to describe Eddie Jones' CV, his record, his history in a single sentence, I don't think I could do it better than to say he's always himself. In 1998, the Brumbies had what would remain their worst ever finish for another 14 years, only to win Super Rugby for the first time a year later. In 2002, Australia had an incredibly unsuccessful autumn tour, beating only Italy before making the World Cup final 12 months later. And in the lead up to 2015, Japan won just one game in the Pacific Nations Cup, losing to US, Canada and Tonga teams who would leave the World Cup winless before creating the biggest upset the game has ever seen. In 2018, England finished the Six Nations fifth, even losing to a French team with a 30-something Lionel bloody box sees at 10 who couldn't even kick the ball out of full time successfully before, 18 months on, smashing the tournament favourites on their way to a World Cup final. And in 2022, England stuttered for a Six Nations where they still finished third. Eddie Jones' teams always dip one year before creating the most iconic moments in the history of our sport. Let's be honest with ourselves. And right now, they could be just dipping before his greatest achievement of all. The big one. The one he's been dreaming of his entire career. His real reason for being. Eddie Jones is always going to be himself. And that man, almost always, creates history. Thank you for watching that. I hope you enjoyed it. That was a very time-consuming video that took a lot of time going over. There's a lot of stuff I left on the cutting room floor in Japan and Australia as well because I just couldn't fit it all into one video. Why it ended up being six hours long. Uh, so thank you for watching what I did leave in. Um, and I hope you enjoyed it. There's also there's plenty more on the channel. There's one on France finishes tournament if you want to go and have a look at that. Uh, I've also covered the England women's team, uh, who are the most dominant team international rugby's ever seen at the minute. 
and that's worth going to look at, please. Uh, there's a podcast where I'm covering games from every World Cup, the idea we're going to do nineteen eighty seven. There's loads more going on. Please go and have a fun round, and I'll see you very soon. Wales, who knows Wales? Is there any Welsh people here? So it's this little shit place <laughs> that's got three million people. Three million people.